Well, it's a joy for us to be here this weekend and to be invited on a special Sunday, Mission Sunday, uh, for us to share. Uh, there's a picture of our family, so you can see our son. Uh, we did leave him in good hands, Ruthann's brother, Tim, uh, and his wife. And so Luke is uh, enjoying time with uh, his cousins. Uh, and in that picture, he's enjoying ice cream. So happy, happy kid. Um, and uh, we did leave him this weekend so that we could be freed up to get to know you guys. So please do come talk to us uh, after service. We'd love to get to know you. Before I get into the message, we wanted to share more about ourselves, our story a little bit, uh, ministry plans. And so on the next slide, uh, you'll see our sending church, uh, just has been mentioned, Lighthouse, and also our missions uh, agency called uh, Biblical Ministries Worldwide. Uh, they've been helpful to us, uh, and we just recently completed their pre-field training. And so we're thankful for them equipping us uh, as we depart soon to Japan. Uh, on the next slide, uh, you'll see our vision for ministry in Japan, which uh, largely consists of three parts. Uh, CBI, Christ Bible Institute, Lagos Community Church, uh, and church planting. And I'll explain briefly each of these. So we'll start with church planting. Uh, this is a map of Japan. Uh, maybe you've recently gone out to Japan for vacation. Uh, you, you know the major cities, Tokyo, Osaka. Maybe you've even went from Tokyo to Osaka. Uh, then likely you've passed by Nagoya, uh, which is the fourth largest metropolitan city in Japan. Uh, this is where we're going to be uh, for at least five, seven years or so. Um, and in Nagoya is um, a church called Lagos Community Church. Uh, and this is actually a church planted by Lighthouse. Uh, two of the elders there, they were uh, Japanese, and they're former interns at Lighthouse. And so we've gotten to visit them and get to know them, uh, the, the leadership in the church as well. And so we're excited to be with them. We're going to learn from the leadership. Uh, and while we're there for the initial five to seven years, uh, the goal is to form a team, uh, and then we'll uh, be sent out by that church to go plant somewhere else in Japan. And our third component is uh, Christ Bible Institute. Uh, we've met Matt Ng here, um, and um, I know that he's been at CBI um, years ago, and so we're going to go with them. They're sponsoring our visa, and they have a two-year internship trap, uh, track uh, focused on church planting, and they're trapping us in Japan as well. Uh, so we're uh, going to go with them, and they're going to help us as we um, hope to uh, serve in Japan long term. At this time, um, I'll share a little bit more personally uh, just as to how the Lord uh, has worked in my heart and led us to this point of wanting to go to Japan. Uh, so my story, I'm second generation Japanese American. I grew up speaking Japanese at home. Uh, my parents are both believers. And I grew up in the South Bay of Southern California, uh, Gardena, Torrance area. Uh, and um, my mom in particular has been a really good influence on me. Uh, she's had a huge burden for the Japanese people uh, to come to know the Lord. And if, uh, you, if you haven't heard or don't know, Japan is considered the second largest unreached people group in the world, according to the Joshua Project. And so growing up, I've heard stories of how uh, difficult it can be, uh, the spiritual darkness in Japan. Uh, and in college was when the Lord really uh, deepened my desire uh, to make Christ known uh, among an unreached people group. And so uh, one, one uh, idea that really impressed upon my heart was that uh, in a place like Japan, uh, you can grow up uh, and not um, having heard of Christ uh, your whole life, uh, not knowing a Christian personally, uh, or having heard the gospel in depth. Uh, maybe you've heard uh, growing up uh, in, a, in school, like Jesus mentioned in a history textbook, but nobody's ever explained to you the gospel. Nobody's ever shown you a life transformed by Christ and the gospel. And that has stuck with me. Uh, and really, it's, it's a stewardship uh, of the gospel. And given the providence of God in my life, uh, just there was a growing desire for me to take Christ and take the gospel to Japan. Ruthann will share a little bit of her story. Hi, yes, we're so excited to be here. I've felt so welcomed already. And um, yeah, my story's a little different than Seichi's. Um, yeah, I grew up in Alabama, and then I moved to California in 2015 and started attending Lighthouse. And I was really missing my friends in Alabama, my church family. And so I just kind of jumped right into Lighthouse and signed up for everything I could so that I could get to know people. and. One of the, the classes I signed up for, one of the things I signed up for was a class that was um, 
called Epic, and it was on missions. And um, the teacher, he asked a really helpful question, and something I, I really hadn't heard before. He asked if um, we had ever considered how the Lord might use us in his kingdom. How, um, yeah, how would the Lord use us in his kingdom? And to pray that, to ask God how he would use us, to not assume that we're just senders, but consider, too, if we would be a goer. And I realized I had just assumed I would be a sender <laughs> and not a goer. That, um, that was something I, I had never considered. I, I kind of um, relegated skills that I had as being mainly um, helpful here, but maybe not on the mission field, um, which was totally false. <laughs> and um, yeah, so as I was praying that prayer, my heart started to grow for missions and not just asking, um, you know, if, if he would want me to go, but desiring to go. The Lord also sent um, some good friends. So I, had a, a fr I have a friend at Lighthouse. Her name is Mei Piao. And um, she and I, we just really hit it off. And um, when she came to Lighthouse soon after me, and um, that was something that she and I talked about, was wanting to grow and being more kingdom-minded. And so we just started praying regularly together to be more kingdom-minded and what the Lord might do um, if he would make clear if we should go, you know. And so, um, so whenever I met Seichi in 2019 um, and we started dating and then we got married, I think that was something we were both, um, yeah, excited to think about together if the Lord would send us to Japan, and um, Lord willing, we are excited to, to go in, in the new year, and um, that's a little bit about our, our story and how the Lord has brought us to this point. Um, as Seichi mentioned, we just finished BM, our, our training with our missions organization, really helpful um, training um, for church planning. A lot of the content was focused on that, but then they also had some things on just learning to navigate culture and culture shock and as well as something um, just thinking through some of the challenges that would be present for our children as uh, third culture kids and um, that was really helpful for me to think through to for us both to talk about and kind of anticipate maybe for our little boy Luca what it might be like um, growing up for him and trusting the Lord with um, the challenges that come. Um, we also got to take a survey trip in 2022, so we were um, hoping to go to Japan, um, yeah, sooner, but then, you know, with COVID, it was locked down for a long time, so in October of 2022, we got to go, and we were there for a month, um, and two of the weeks we were in Nagoya, and it was so helpful to get to know um, the Japanese people more, the Japanese church, the church at Lagos. I, it was my first time, so I was learning a lot and really enjoying, um, yeah, Japanese food, eating noodles like every day, and um, yeah, it was it was so helpful just to to know more of the need as well to to get to be there, um, yeah, and then I also just in preparation for what we're doing before we go um, is language study, especially for me because I um, do not know Japanese. So I've been learning, uh, learning a lot, trying to do more self-paced study, but last semester I got to take a, a, a class at a community college, and um, man, that was, that was so helpful. So I um, feel like there's a, a, a good foundation for grammar and those types of things, and I'll get to take another uh, couple of classes this coming semester for, for Japanese language, and that'll continue whenever we arrive in Japan as well. But, um, but yeah, very thankful for the preparation we've gotten to do so far. So we know that missions is a church-wide <laughs> church effort, sorry, uh, and missionaries are sent out by a church uh, and supported by churches, other churches and individuals partnering with us. And so we've prayerfully considered uh, what other churches uh, we can reach out to to partner with us, and uh, the Lord has been kind uh, to connect us with you guys, with Berean Mission Church. Um, and, and now have this opportunity uh, just to start that relationship, getting to, to know y'all and, and to be known by you guys as well. So as you listen to the preaching of God's word uh, this morning, uh, and then hopefully if you do get a chance to talk with us afterwards, um, please, please do consider uh, taking a prayer card uh, um, on the, the back table outside. And then please do pray, pray for us uh, that the light of the gospel, the light of Christ would truly shine uh, in the spiritual darkness of Japan. <laughs> 
So if you have your Bibles, uh, turn in them with me to Acts 14. Acts 14. Among the many passages that we could look at on this broad topic of missions, uh, there is one I want us to consider. And this passage will remind us, as a local church, the central task that Christ has commissioned us to do, uh, to make disciples of all the nations, uh, something that should not be forgotten in the life of any church, uh, something that should not be laid aside to the fringe, or something that only a, a few in the church should be thinking about. Rather, the task of missions should be infused into the lifeblood of the whole church. My goal for the message this morning is to define this task of missions, and then to stir your heart for missions, to stir your heart that we would together obey and fulfill the Great Commission. Uh, if you're like me, uh, it's quite easy to get really caught up in a task that I'm doing, uh, whether it's for work or for leisure. I can be so zoomed in at times that I lose perspective on other important things going on. And it, as an example, uh, early on in ministry, uh, I would take forever working on a message, and I could, just, I could just keep working on it for a whole day, multiple days, you know, other than eating and sleeping, I'm just doing this. In fact, sad story, uh, when Ruthann and I first started dating, our very first Valentine's Day was approaching, and uh, my, I was giving a message um, that Friday, uh, and so the Valentine's Day was Friday. Um, and so because I would be preaching that evening, I'd ask beforehand if we could do something special the following day on Saturday. And so come Friday, I'm working on this sermon, and as embarrassing as it is now, uh, I hadn't sent a single message, text to, to Ruth Ann. I hadn't communicated her at, with her at all until after I gave the message that evening. And so basically, she got nothing from me for the whole day until the, uh, that night. And so I'm here to tell you that that was a long time ago, and I repented. And God has grown me a ton since then. Uh, you probably would never do what I did, uh, but I think you can relate with me that whether it's your work, your studies, hobby, or even a relationship, uh, it's quite easy to have tunnel vision, just to be so wrapped up in something that we lose perspective on the things that matter. Uh, now, there are many things that God has called us to as local churches, as we gather weekly uh, for worship, and we, throughout the week, we bear one another's burdens, we confess our sins to one another, we, we serve each other and we encourage each other, we study and learn the word of God together. Uh, but we must never forget that what God has called us to is also to look beyond the needs of our church, to not stay insular, uh, but to look beyond as far out as those among the nations who have never heard of Christ. Because that... Uh, is the commission that we have all received from our Lord to go and make disciples of all the nations. But what exactly is it that we are trying to do in missions? While I wholeheartedly believe that uh, compassion ministry, meeting the physical needs of people, are absolutely vital, necessary, we cannot say we are fulfilling the Great Commission if the primary thing that we are doing as churches is to alleviate poverty or establish hospitals or provide education, job training, so forth. While again, these things certainly complement, can complement the task of missions. Or even if we were focused on evangelism, is the task of missions completed if we're doing public preaching or going door to door or hosting evangelistic Bible studies? And if people do come to know the Lord through these means, praise God, but then what? Now, what are we aiming at in missions? And this is the main idea of the message, this sermon. The task of missions is church planting and strengthening. Now, it's for Christ to be made known among the nations through planting and then strengthening churches. Now, we want to think as God thinks about how we are to carry out his mission. And so we take our cue from his word. And while this message is admittedly not comprehensive and all that can be said about the task of missions, we're going to take a look at this passage that has several key components of the missionary task. Uh, Acts 14, we're just going to focus on three verses mainly, verses 21 to 23. And before we read those verses, I want to give you the context of our passage. So here we see that Paul is on his first missionary journey. In a chapter before, in chapter 13, verse 2, we see that Paul and Barnabas, they have been sent out as missionaries by the church in Antioch. 
And the Holy Spirit is the one who actually sets apart these two men for this task. And the church in Antioch sends them off. Paul and Barnabas, they travel to different towns and cities proclaiming the word. And as a custom, they first go to the Jewish synagogue because they know that Jews, they, they know scripture. They want to speak to the, to the Jews and explain to them from the Old Testament that the Messiah, he had to suffer, rise from the dead, and that this Jesus is that Messiah. Now some who hear this message, they believe, but many others don't. And the unbelieving Jews, they stir up the Gentiles so that both groups, unbelieving Jews and Gentiles, they attempt to mistreat and then persecute and then even stone Paul and Barnabas. Now these two missionaries, they escape and then move on to other towns and they keep doing the same thing. They preach the gospel with the risk of harm. But the unbelieving Jews are so jealous of people turning to this Jesus, they're so angry and fed up with this teaching with these men, that when they hear that Paul and Barnabas are going to such and such a town, they actually go to that town, even traveling 80 to 100 miles. They rile up the crowd there and convince the people there that Paul is a fool and worthy of death. Now, this is what happens right before our text in the town of Lystra. There are unbelieving Jews who come from Antioch and Iconium, and they go over to Lystra, and they win over the crowds there to their side. Now, what is perplexing about all this is that moments before, the same crowd in Lystra, they see Paul heal a lame man and, and make this lame man walk. And, and that same people are amazed and treat Paul and Barnabas as gods, even wanting to offer sacrifices to them. But then they do this 180-degree turn because of the convincing rhetoric of the unbelieving Jews. The, the crowds there, they actually turn on Paul and the Jews there, they, they stone Paul, actually thinking that he's dead. And then they leave Paul outside the city. And Paul is so badly beaten, he's, he's likely unconscious. And as disciples uh, in that town of Lystra, they, they gather around Paul, miracle of miracles. Uh, the passage it really just says, Paul, he just gets up. And then he goes back to that same town where he, where he was persecuted. And the next day, Paul and Barnabas then move on to another town, which is called Derb. So, to, to say the least, this is, this is a very eventful, highly charged missionary journey with much opposition. Now we find ourselves in the town of Derb. I'll read for us verses 21 to 23. When they, when Paul and Barnabas had preached the gospel to that city of Derb and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Now, as I mentioned, one thing that we can learn from these patterns and acts is how we are to engage in missions today. Now, what are we supposed to do in missions? And I mentioned that the task of missions is church planting and strengthening. Now, whatever specific ministry, uh, ministry a missionary sets out to do, whether it's related to music or health or education, it should be about the local church. It should flow out of and into the local church. It should advance and contribute to the work of church planting or strengthening. I'm going to organize uh, this main idea under two headings, church planting and then church strengthening. So first, planting churches. Now, what does missions look like on the ground? You know, this is the bread and butter of missions. This is what you immediately think of when you hear missions, evangelism, and discipleship. Right, we see this in verse 21, when Paul and Barnabas had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples. And the task of missions involves proclaiming the gospel and then teaching God's word to those who do believe. And this is what Paul and Barnabas do. Now, first, they preached the gospel. And in the early church, we see that Peter, Paul, and the apostles uh, and, and the evangelists, they, they do many good works. Uh, in fact, in the power of God, they performed signs and wonders. They made the lame walk. They casted out demons, healed the sick, even raised the dead. But these miracles in the early church all served a purpose. They were not done in isolation. Through these signs and wonders, 
The Lord was testifying to his message of grace. The works complemented the message. Now, the driving thing for Paul and Barnabas was to speak, to declare the gospel. Now, what is this gospel? The good news that we as Christians need to hear from the pulpit, need to remember every day. And this is the same message that as missionaries we seek to proclaim in Japan. And if you are here today and you do not consider yourself a Christian, do not have a saving relationship with Christ, I urge you to hear this gospel of God. Even, even as a church, you can't assume that missionaries will just tell a gospel. You have to hear what is it that we are actually proclaiming, and this is it. It's the truth that God, the one living and true God, who created the heavens and the earth, all living creatures, he has created us, people, made in his image, made to live in God's world for his glory, made to enjoy his bounty and his goodness for his praise. But since the first man and woman, each of us, every single one of us, has gone astray, turning to our own way, forgetting God, rejecting him, now, not giving him thanks, but instead in our selfishness and violence, we, we use others, seek from created things, pleasure, comfort, ease, happiness for our own gain, not for his glory. And this is sin. This is our cosmic rebellion towards him. It is the source of all the evil, suffering, and brokenness of this world. And the scriptures declare that our sin means death for us, a death that is eternal, conscious torment separated from a good and gracious God. And we are justly condemned. But in our folly, most of us think that we are not that bad, that we are not evil. We even think we can make ourselves right by our good works, by our being a good neighbor, by, maintain, by maintaining social harmony, like in the case of Japan, or by adherence to some man-made religion. But we do not understand how pervasive sin is, the incalculable debt of our sin, the great cosmic offense that our sin is against God. We cannot make ourselves right. But the gloriously good news is that God in his great mercy, he has made a way for us to be made right with him. That while we were still his enemies in his great love, God has sent his son. He has fulfilled his promise made long ago that he would send a savior, his son, who would crush the enemy of death, crush the enemy of Satan, who will restore us to a relationship with himself. And how does he do this? How does Christ do this? By living a, a life that we should have lived, by living a perfectly obedient life and dying as our perfect sacrifice, by bearing our sin, taking on the judgment of God in our place. And not only did he stay dead or die for us, but he rose from the dead, assuring us that we too can be declared righteous through trusting in Christ alone. This is the gospel, and this is the message that Christ has commissioned us to proclaim. He says repentance for forgiveness of sins will be proclaimed in his name to all the nations. And we must go out because God has fixed a day when everyone will be judged. That day will come when all mankind will see Christ and we will either stand condemned in righteous judgment in our sins, or we will tremble with joy inexpressible as we finally behold our Savior. And so this is why the church sends, this is why missionaries go, so that through the gospel, the good shepherd Christ himself is gathering to himself all his sheep, those who are not yet of his fold. Now this is the gospel that Ruth Ann and I intend to tell forth in Japan. And Paul and Barnabas, they proclaimed this message of good news. Second, they also, we see in the text, they made disciples. Now, Paul and Barnabas heralded this gospel not only as the entry point in our salvation, but as the grace in which we presently stand. The, the gospel as the foundation for an entire life of discipleship. Now, why do we, as the church, preach uh, and, and, and even pray the gospel to ourselves. Why do we remember it daily? It's because the gospel is what shapes us daily so that we are conformed to the character of Christ. It's the gospel that fuels us daily 
so that our hearts are properly motivated to obey Christ and trust him. Now, it's the gospel that reorients us daily so that our purpose in life truly is to live for God's glory, not for ourselves, but for Christ's sake. It's the gospel that fills our hearts with hope in the darkness of this world so that we are reminded where we are heading, our future hope, the glory that is to come. The gospel of grace is what we need daily. It drives a lifetime of following Jesus. And this is what Paul and Barnabas, the first missionaries, what they're after. They weren't interested in merely getting professions of faith or even converts. By the grace of God, they wanted to see disciples of Christ. In our passage in Acts, the author Luke actually chooses a word, uh, the verb made disciples. Uh, in the Greek, it's matetuo. And this, this word is only used actually a handful of times in the New Testament including, as you guys know, once in Jesus' great commission. And so Luke is describing what Paul and Barnabas are doing as keeping in step with Christ's commission to go and make disciples of all the nations. And this task of making disciples isn't just about preaching to the masses and then quickly moving on to another group of people. Now, it's not stated exactly how long Paul and Barnabas stayed in Derb, but we know from other passages in Acts that they stayed in places like Antioch, Corinth, Ephesus, for an extended period of time, months, maybe even years. The point is that it takes time, effort, and intentionality to grow as a disciple of Christ. And the very word itself means to be a learner, a pupil. We're constantly learning, learning all that Christ has commanded us, learning how to live that out in the particular uh, role that God has assigned us and in the particular season he has in right, uh, us in right now. We're also learning the whole counsel of God, the breadth and depth of Scripture, that is from Genesis through Re Revelation, his, his plans and purposes through redemptive history. And ultimately, we are learning a person. We are learning Christ himself, what it means to abide and rest in him daily, what it means to depend on him in the day-to-day, -day, what it means to make much of Christ in the choices that we make, what it means to bear the image of Christ in any and every situation. Now let me emphasize the importance of discipleship by way of explaining a little bit just the spiritual state of Japan. Now when people think of Japan, they usually don't think Japan is an unreached people group. You know, it's very modern, advanced in technology, developed economically, so forth. But the history of Japan shows that the gospel has never really taken deep root and established uh, through healthy churches across the country. And a statistic, a statistic that you begin to quite, uh, hear quite often is that with a population of about 120 million people, evangelical Christians are, are less than 1%, 0.3%. And this, is, this has always been the case for Japan. And so people have wondered, why? Why is it like this? And why has it even been called a, a missionary graveyard? It's a graveyard not because people go there to die physically, uh, but because missionaries have tended to go and move on to other people groups and lands because they see little to no fruit in Japan. Now, of course, a, a long study of this, it, you gotta factor in all the religious reasons, the, the Shintoism, Buddhism, the, the social cultural reasons, the, the culture of overworking, collectivist society that values conformity, um, and, and these other uh, cultural things. But I believe that what it all comes down to, uh, in my admittedly limited observation and experience, is that the church must grow up into maturity. Because discipleship means growing in Christ-likeness in all areas of our lives. Now, people in Japan, they need to hear the truth of God, and then they need to see lives transformed by the grace of God. What people need to see is a living hope that abounds in the face of great suffering. They need to see a faith that perseveres in the midst of pressures, of school, of work. They need to see a commitment to the family and the home, not letting work become an enslaving idol. They need to see joy in a marriage rooted in Christ, 
a, a marriage that is vibrant and close, characterized by sacrificial love, joy, unity. They need to see real and deep relationships, true friendships in the church, where there is vulnerability, where there's trust, where there is sharing in each other's joys and sorrows. What people need to see in Japan is, is a hunger and thirst for truth, for the word in, in your devotions and study, a, a dependent life of prayer. What people need to see in Japan is, is wisdom given as faithful friends and counselors in the church are, are walking with people, fighting sin and hurting through suffering. And by the grace of God, whether it's in Japan or some other unreached people group or, or here, by the grace of God, he does not leave us in our infancy in our faith. He matures us. So the task of missions involves not just this initial work of church planting, but strengthening the local church. So the second part, strengthening the local church. Now, how are local churches strengthened? We see three ways from our passage. The first is there is encouragement through suffering. Second, we see that elders are appointed. And third, we see them being entrusted to the Lord. Now, first, uh, an encouragement through suffering. Now, Paul and Barnabas, we see that they preached the gospel in these various towns, and then they make disciples. Now, did they complete their mission at that point? They made disciples. And so they can just move on, right? They move on to new towns, to new places, to new people groups. They can just keep moving forward, don't look back. But that's not necessarily what they do. They actually returned to these towns that they've been in. Now, verse 21, what did they do when they preached the gospel to that city of Dur, made many disciples? It says they returned to Lystra, to Iconium, and to Antioch. Now, Luke records this pretty matter-of-factly, but we have to remember that Paul, he, people just threw stones at him in Lystra. Now, their lives would still be endangered in these towns. Why would Paul and Barnabas be willing to go back to these very places where the risk of persecution is still high? Well, verse 22, they needed to strengthen the souls of the disciples. They knew that the disciples who continued to live in these towns, that they would face persecution and hardships, and they would need strong encouragement. Now, for Paul and Barnabas, this determination to, to exhort, encourage, uh, it's not isolated to this one incident. Now, they've done this before. In Acts 11, verse 23, we read that Barnabas, he exhorted all the Jewish and Gentile believers in Antioch to remain faithful to the Lord. Remain faithful to the Lord. In chapter 13, verse 43, we see that Paul and Barnabas urged the believers in Pisidian Antioch to continue in the grace of God. Continue in the grace of God. So we see not only do people need the teaching of God's word, we also need exhortation. So in our passage, how, how do Paul and Barnabas encourage them to continue in the faith? We read in verse 22, the, saying that through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. Now another translation uh, renders this verse, it is necessary to go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. Now where does this conviction come from? That many tribulations are necessary to enter the kingdom of God. And we get it from our, our Lord himself. Right? Christ himself has said uh, to his disciples that if the world persecuted Christ, they're going to also persecute his followers. Now we think, how, how is this truth an encouragement? It's necessary for us to suffer for the faith. Now it's an encouragement because this word necessary shows that hardships are in fact according to the plan of God. Now behind the Greek word day that's used here for must or necessary, behind that word is a theology of God's sovereignty, how he is orchestrating all things according to his good and gracious plan. Now it's been used many th times in the New Testament. Acts 9, 16, the Lord says to Paul, I will show him, Paul, how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. Acts 17, 3, Paul says, explaining and proving that it was necessary for Christ to suffer, to rise from the dead. Now, this word must indicates 
that all these things, whether it's Paul's great suffering as an apostle, whether it's the death and resurrection of Christ, all these things are what God ordains. In other words, they're not unfortunate accidents. They're not proof that God has forgotten or abandoned his people. It's not proof that God has removed his love from them or that he is powerless to prevent persecution from them. That in fact, it's the opposite. These tribulations are ordained by God to be the pathway to glory. You will enter the kingdom of God. You will. There is a heavenly kingdom. And as co-heirs with Christ, we will receive the fullness of this inheritance kept in heaven for us, provided that we suffer with Christ. Now we know that such hardships are not just true, only for those disciples in Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch. It's not just because of their unique circumstance as the beginning of the early church or that it's a particularly hostile time and culture for them. Now, of course, while degrees of persecution for our faith vary from culture to culture, time to time, it is true that it is something that God ordains for all of us. Now, Paul actually refers to this period uh, in Acts 14. He refers to it later in, in life in 2 Timothy 3. Now, Paul says to Timothy, Timothy, he writes in the third chapter that in the last days, there are going to be times of difficulty. People will be lovers of self. Evil people will go from bad to worse. But then he says, you, Timothy, you, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, which persecutions I endured. Yet from them all, the Lord rescued me. And here's the point for all of us here in this room. It says, verse 12, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Now, the reality of suffering for one's faith is, is for all believers. And this is why at the start of, of Paul's second missionary journey in Acts 15, Paul tells Barnabas, let's go back and visit the brothers and sisters in every town that we've preached, and let's see how they're doing. Are they wavering in the faith? Is there compromise? Are they still holding fast to Christ? And this is why over and over again in Acts, it says the apostles and prophets strengthened the churches. Acts 15.32, Judas and Silas, they encouraged and strengthened the brothers in Antioch with many words. Chapter 15, verse 41, Paul went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Acts 16, verse 5, the churches were strengthened in the faith by Paul, Silas, and Timothy. Acts 18, 23, Paul, he goes through the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. Now, this is a high priority in their missionary endeavor. This is why the missionary task involves not only planting, establishing churches, but also strengthening the church. When things are hard, when we are weak, we need others in our lives to tell us not to give up, to persevere in the faith. Now, after college, I had the opportunity to work in Japan for two years. I was teaching English. And one of the greatest blessings of my time there uh, was a friendship that I had formed with a brother who, uh, who was close in age and who was like-minded uh, in our conviction. Now, after moving to Japan, I visited a, a few churches, and I was prayerfully deciding which one I would be a part of and commit to. And I remember the second church I visited, uh, which ended up being the one I stayed at. I'm walking on the street towards the church address, and I come across this a small sign on a wall. And I almost miss it because I can't see it from the side of the street that I'm walking on. And the sign says, Sigil, Sigil Bible Church, and it's, it has an arrow pointing this way uh, toward the house. It's, it's through this narrow driveway. And as I walk toward a house, I see uh, this shed-like building. Uh, I, I learn that it's, it's a pre prefab uh, on the side of someone's house. And it looks like a shed, so I wasn't sure uh, if this was the church. Uh, but as I got closer to the door, uh, someone opened the sliding door and greeted me. And I walked in, and I sit in uh, one of the front rows, and at the end was a, a guy, a young man in his 20s, uh, and we introduced ourselves. 
Uh, and after service, he took me uh, to a restaurant. We shared our stories, uh, and there began a friendship uh, that has lasted to this very day. Now, we weren't in a big city. Uh, it's, it's like a mixture of rural and suburb. It's a small church with maybe a dozen adults and a few children. Now, this was a, a church that lost its founding pastor um, over 20 years ago now, but they still met weekly with visiting pastors just preaching for them on a Sunday. So in such a place, uh, it's rare to find a guy in his 20s who's earnest in his faith, seriously following Christ. And yet in the Lord's kindness, uh, he provided this brotherhood, this friendship to me. It was a gift to one another. And, and this friendship was truly a lifeline for me during my time in Japan. We meditated on the word together, prayed together, took trips together. He introduced me to many of his brothers and sisters. Uh, and also, I learned a lot about the church in Japan through this particular friendship. And during the week, uh, we would call and talk uh, over, the, in, over the phone. And, and I remember sometimes he would be discouraged at the beginning of the conversation whether it's just long hours at work uh, or just a feeling of loneliness in the church uh, or it was maybe a difficult friendship that he had uh, in the church or, or even larger picture, seeing the church in Japan drift away from the authority of God's word. And even though he started that conversation discouraged, by the end of that conversation, he would be encouraged as he is processing with me, with a brother who has like-minded convictions, uh, as he remembered truths about who God is and God's care for him. I could hear, noticeably hear the difference in tone. I remember his, his joy. And while I can communicate in Japanese fairly well, you know, I'm quite far from the level of a native speaker, and so I remember thinking, wow, I'm not that confident in Japan, Japanese, and I honestly um, hadn't said a whole lot in this conversation. I mostly listened, but I am so glad that I can be this much of an encouragement to this brother. Now, church strengthening is absolutely vital to the task of missions because persevering in the faith is something we all need. Persecution can cause us to fear. Great sorrows, isolation, losses in life can got, cause us to doubt the personal love of God for us. And the cares of the world and the burdens we bear, if we are not finding our hope in Christ, these things can seriously weaken our resolve. They can dampen our zeal. They can cool our fervent love for Christ and others. Now, is this you right now? Now, are you suffering right now? Are you discouraged and faint-hearted in your faith? In our suffering, and our struggles, we can feel so alone. We can fear people's judgment. We can be afraid to invite someone in. We can believe the lie that no one really cares. But can I encourage you to lean in to a brother or sister here? Without these relationships in the church, we cannot persevere in the faith. But together we can walk in the light. Together we can go deeper in our friendships. Together we can weep and rejoice. Together we can know and be truly known in our hearts. Together we remind one another that it is through these very trials that God is working. He is preparing us for his kingdom. And this is how the church is strengthened, by being encouraged through suffering. A second way we see uh, the church being strengthened is elders being appointed. You see that in verse 23, when Paul and Barnabas had appointed elders for them in every church. Now when Christ the good shepherd calls his sheep to himself, Christ does not leave his sheep stranded, defenseless, or wandering about on their own. Christ provides protection and care through under-shepherds. The church needs leadership, needs pastoral care. Ephesians 4 states that Christ has given gifts to the church, and part of that is pastors and teachers, those who shepherd the flock. And we see this in the early church as churches were established. In Acts 15, we see there were elders in the church in Jerusalem. Acts 20, we see there were elders in the church in Ephesus. Uh, we see there were overseers, elders in the church in Philippi. And we see not just one pastor, 
or elder, but a plurality of shepherds for these local churches. Now, just a, a group of believers don't make up a church. There is a need for the flock to be led, cared for, protected spiritually. This includes, on the part of elders, a, a commitment to preaching God's word, to expositing and explaining it and applying it. It includes practicing the ordinances of baptism and communion, which are visible expressions of the gospel. It includes preserving the, unity, uh, the, the purity of the church through church discipline. And now this is how the church is strengthened. Now in our passage in Acts 14, 23, uh, we know that appointing elders was not a one-time occurrence for Paul. In fact, in Titus 1, 5, a pastoral epistle, Paul explains why he left a Titus in the island of Crete. He says in verse 5, this is why I left you, uh, Titus, in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. Uh, this appointing of elders for churches, it is a pattern in Paul's ministry. In Titus 1, later on in verse 9, after giving the character qualifications of an elder, Paul says elders are to hold fast, hold firmly to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction and sound doctrine, and also to rebuke those who contradict it. Elders must not only know the Bible well enough to teach sound doctrine, he must also correct false teachers. That is to say, to protect the church from being mis misguided from false teaching. Now, in the mission field, there's always the danger of syncretism and false teaching. And one of the challenges of missions in Japan is that there are so many religious groups that have formed, especially in the mid to late 20th century. And sometimes the teaching, teachings of the Bible are mixed in. There is a, a cult group, for example, called al uh, where the founder had claimed to be Christ, even identified himself as the Lamb of God. And this group is known for uh, a famous deadly incident in 1995, uh, where its members released sarin gas in the Tokyo subway, uh, killing 13 people, injuring countless others. Now, such cult ac activity creates fear throughout Japanese society. You know, don't be associated with any of these religious groups. Uh, being a part of these groups, extremists and religious fanatics, you're, you're going to be mind-controlled. Now, add to this that there are Christian, or, you know, quote, Christian cults that present a false gospel. I remember uh, in the area where I lived in Japan, which is a little bit more rural, I was in a train and looking out through the window and I see, uh, in a neighboring city, I see two Mormon missionaries uh, riding their bicycle. Um, and, and, you know, I'm thinking to myself, man, they are out here too, right? Like, all the way out here. Uh, and in my apartment, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses come knocking on my door as well. Now, here's the point. For an average Japanese person, who has little to no knowledge of the Bible, now these groups are all the same, Christianity. Now they're all lumped together. Now how critical it is anywhere, uh, whether in Japan or here as well, how critical is it that pastors and elders equip the church so that the church is protected by sound doctrine and guarded from distortions of the true gospel? Now, we see ch churches are, are strengthened, one, by being encouraged to persevere through suffering, secondly, by elders being appointed to guard the flock, and then third, we see in our passage, by the church being entrusted to the Lord. Now, at, at some point, missionaries have to move on. Now, certainly, they, they feel the sense of what Paul feels for the churches. This is what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 11. He says, there is daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. There's this great concern for these churches. So what must missionaries do? And what does Paul and Barnabas, what do they do? Now, before the missionaries, Paul and Barnabas, moved on, they committed these churches to the Lord with prayer and fasting. Ultimately, it is the Lord, by his grace, who keeps his people. Now, the task of missions fails utterly without the grace of God. So humble prayerful dependence on the Lord is absolutely necessary. It goes hand in hand with carrying out the work of God. Because it's only by the grace of God that people come to faith, only by the grace of God that people grow in faith, and only by the grace of God that people are kept in faith to the end. In the passage 
right after ours, we see that this is all called the grace of God. Look with me down at verse 24. We're going to read from verse 24 to the end of the chapter. Then they passed through Pisidia and came to Pamphylia. And when they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Italia. And from there they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work that they had fulfilled. And when they arrived and gathered the church together, they declared all that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And they remained no little time with the disciples. Now this is how Paul and Barnabas conclude their first missionary journey. Back in chapter 13, it says they were set apart by the Holy Spirit for the work to which he called them. And now in chapter 14, the passage we just read, we see that this work has been fulfilled. Uh, This work that included church planting and strengthening in these various towns. People coming to faith, people growing as disciples, people gathered as churches, people uh, being strengthened to face opposition, elders being appointed, them being prayed for. It is all called the grace of God. And we see that missionaries are not spiritual uh, Rambos, you know, just off on their own. Missionaries are accountable to local churches back home. And churches and the individuals that make them, they truly partner with missionaries, prayerfully, financially, supporting the ongoing ministry of God as Christ builds his church among the nations. And missionaries don't just go out and think, you know, we're going to be all in, which means we're never coming back. You know, we're all in, we're completely invested in the people there. But part of why missionaries periodically come back is to show that this truly is a partnership. Missionaries get to report on the fruit of our collective labor and gospel partnership so that together, together, those who go out and those who send, we get to rejoice in the grace of God as more churches are planted and strengthened. Now, Berean Mission Church, uh, while we are the ones going out and we are being supported by our sending church and supporting churches such as yourself, um, we are, in a sense, following in your footsteps. Um, Some of you have, uh, you you are an example to us of what Christ has commissioned us to go out and do many years ago. Um, Those of you, some of you in this room have stepped out in faith to start this church or to join uh, a young church, to see people in this community reached for Christ. And not just that people would profess faith in Christ as newfound believers, but to grow up into maturity, into the fullness of Christ. And we ourselves are uh, being sent out to essentially do the same thing, but in a different context, different language, different culture. Now, we desire that many in Japan, Japan would come to know and experience what you are experiencing and presently enjoying right now. Your greatest satisfaction found not in your own exaltation, or not, in the case of Japan, their exaltation as a nation, but your greatest satisfaction found in the worship of Christ, knowing him, the one who alone is worthy of worship from every tribe, from every language, from every people. Now, as as you, Berean Mission Church, faithfully endure in making disciples here in this community, in San Francisco, in the Bay Area, we pray also that you would remember those who go, and you would remember this task of missions to pray, partner with us so that this same grace of God would extend to more and more people as far out as Japan and to the ends of the earth. Let me close in prayer for us. Our gracious Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, that You are a missional God, that you are a God who sends, Lord. You sent your Son to redeem us. And the Son has been sent out and gone so that he would come rescue us. And we really are image bearers of God as we ourselves go and show forth your goodness, your glory, your love as we proclaim what Christ has done. So I pray, Father, that you would further deepen the good work that you've been doing at Berean. Continue to make it flourish so that the name of Christ will be exalted in. In his name we pray, amen.
Church, would you please rise? <laughs>